Um, a big thank you to Dr. Eva Wojcik and the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine uh, at Loyola University Medical Center for hosting today's Grand Rounds. And now I'd like to request Dr. Wojcik, the Chair of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Loyola, to kindly introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Dr. Mirza. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone, depends on the time zone. This is truly indeed a great, great pleasure to welcome our virtual pathology ground round speaker, Dr. Christina Arnold. Dr. Arnold is an associate professor in the, the Digestive Disease Service in the Department of Pathology at the University of Colorado in Denver. She has co-authored two pathology textbooks and uh, is a, an editor for an Atlas-based surgical pathology textbook series with Dr. Elizabeth Montgomery and Dora Lim Hemlin. Dr. Arnold serves on the Curriculum Com Education Committee for the College of American Pathologists, is the editor for the American Journal of Surgical Pathology and Archives of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, Jim, and also know. served as a vice chair. Jim, Jim, chair Jim, for the for Roger Haggett Gastrointestinal Pathology Society Education Committee. She has received a number of teaching and career development awards, including top five of pathology professionals under the age of 40 by American Society for Clinical Pathology in 2016, and three times featured on the power list of the top 100 pathologists worldwide by the Pathologist Magazine. She publishes and lectures nationally and internationally on trending topics in GI pathology, social media, and wellness. We are delighted that she is joining us today and look forward to the, her talk titled Decoding Colitis and Field Guide to Inflammatory Bowel Disease Mimics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arnold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to start by thanking Dr. Wojciech for this invitation. Loyola has a very special place in my heart. There's so much innovation and education and leadership coming from Loyola, and it is just my distinct honor and pleasure to, to be here today in this capacity. Uh, I wanted to point out my Twitter handle and email are here. If we don't get to your questions during the session, feel free to contact me and we can continue offline. The title of my talk is Decoding Colitis, a Field Guide to Inflammatory Bowel Disease Mimics. This is my favorite. I love GI pathology, but this is my favorite topic of all topics for three reasons. One is because it's very common. So if you sign out GI with any regularity, you're seeing these cases every day. Two, they're very challenging. We have a lot of potential to do great service for our patients. If we say a case is IBD and that patient has IBD and they get surveillance and you know suppression, a possible resection, we've helped decrease their chance of cancer. That's fantastic. But we can also do a lot of harm if we label a patient with IBD who has a curable infection, for example. That person would get unnecessary immunosuppression, surveillance, a possible resection. So we have the opportunity to do a lot of good, a lot of harm, and in this talk, I hope that it's easier to do good. The third reason why I like this topic is there's a lot of, this area is evolving. So every time you dip into PubMed, you're gonna pull up a new cause of chronic colitis. And if you remember only one sentence of this whole hour, of all the slides I'm gonna show you, please remember this. Chronic colitis is specific for nothing. IBD should always be a diagnosis of exclusion. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the slide deck. Here we go. I wanna start with this picture. I am not from Colorado, but I got here as quick as I could. It's a beautiful state. Please come and visit once this is COVID crisis resolves. I show this picture to acknowledge where we are. No matter where you are hearing this from, your world has changed in a profound way very quickly as it, it is, has for all of us. And I share this picture to hopefully share some hope. This was after a very long day of climbing. We didn't bring enough water or enough food. We got lost several times. There's these huge majestic trees in the background and, the, and this is a, a canyon. At the very edge of the canyon, this little tree was making its way. And it just, it, I think it just gives us so much hope for a better tomorrow. 
Okay, so the first question we start to talk on colitis is why is this important? Who cares? Why is this important? Well, this is a study that's coming out soon. Dr. Meredith Pittman from Wild Cornell is the lead author. And in this study, we looked at material true GI consults from nine institutions across the country, major academic medical centers. And we asked, what are the issues that are really plaguing the pathologist? What cases are they sending out? What do they need help with? And let that drive, let that content drive future studies, education, and help training our future pathologists. So over the course of this year, we had collected about this is this this is needs to be updated closer to 1500 true consults from these seven centers. We aggregated the data according to part type and lower GI was about 21% of all of our cases. And then we asked what are these terminal ileum colon biopsies resections being sent for the majority were for polyp classification and dysplasia grading and 20% of them were for help with classifying ileitis and colitis. So we know this these are common issues. To take this a step further, we then studied how often does the expert agree with a submitting pathologist, and that was about 56% of the time. That's really huge. That means there's almost half of the time there's a disagreement, and when there was a disagreement, which is represented on this side, it was most often a major disagreement that would have led to a difference in management, and we, the experts tended to downgrade that diagnosis from the submitting pathologist. Of course, there are limitations with the study, and one of them includes the expert isn't always correct, but we just nevertheless in this body of work identified lots of areas where we could do better as a field and IBD chronic colitis was one of those leading areas. So that's why we care about chronic colitis. I know we have some med students and some junior residents out there in the audience, so I next wanted to just start off with some basic definitions so we're all on the same page, we're all using the same terms as we go a little deeper into this topic. So let's start off with definitions. Acute colitis refers to neutrophils in the crypt epithelium, this is cryptitis. When the neutrophils are in the crypt lumen, this is crypt abscess. Acute colitis can also refer to the presence of an erosion or an ulceration. Chronic colitis is much more interesting. That's the subject of this talk. And any one of these features in any proportion will buy you a diagnosis of chronic colitis. Oh, pardon me. That includes pyloric gland metaplasia or panacell metaplasia that's present or absent. Yes or no, that's a little straightforward. The last two are more difficult and we're gonna look at pictures of this. It includes increased lamina propria, chronic inflammation and architectural distortion. Keep in mind that when I, we use the term architectural distortion, that's shorthand to include any of these other features. That's a villiform mucosal surface, abnormal crypt shapes, crypt dropout, crypt shortfall, and basal lymphoplasma cytosis. When you hear these words on the left, these are buzzwords for chronic colitis but they do not equal IBD. Okay, so now let's have, I wanna offer two tips as you sit down with you and your glass slide of the microscope. Here are two tips that are really important to keep in mind. The first is biopsy location is important. So if there are any clinicians out there, the request from your pathologist is please tell us where you are in the colon. And that's because the normal right colon looks very different than the normal left colon. And we need to know that in order to set our barometers or, or, or thresholds for what's normal and abnormal. And the normal right colon, it looks busier, doesn't it? It's because we have more enterocytes. We have more lamin appropriate chronic inflammatory cells. We have fewer goblet cells. And panis cells in the normal right colon are normal. There's a little bit of, I don't know if you guys can see this, but that just kind of popped up. We'll just ignore that. And the normal left colon looks different. It looks more empty because we have more goblet cells. We have fewer enterocytes, fewer lamin appropriate chronic inflammatory cells. And if you see panis cells on the left, that is abnormal. Okay. Um, tissue oriented, so that line is still there, but I will, I'm going to keep plowing along unless I get a note. Uh, second thing to keep in mind as you look to your specimens is that tissue orientation is important. No matter how you get your tissue, whether it's profile, tangential, a burrito, you can assess for architecture, and that's really important to do the most good that you can with whatever's on your slide. All right, so for our students and our trainees, our brain loves to think in profile. Our brain likes to think in this dimension. So this is normal colon in profile. 
And a normal colonic architecture is analogous to test tubes in a rack, which is put here, where each test tube is superimposable with its neighbor because it's the same size and it's separated by the same amount of lamina propria. That's analogous to the normal colonic architecture in profile. But you can also assess architecture if you have a tangential section. So that is the specimen got embedded on, on its surface. So you're taking that rack of test tubes, pulling it close, and you can see every crypt is superimposable on its neighbor. It's the same size, separated by the same amount of lamina propria. Okay, so um, now let's look at a few examples of architectural distortion. I'm going to keep on the left normal as a reference point. Notice how it's smooth and we have all the crypts superimposable sitting on the muscularis mucosae. And on the right is an example of chronic colitis. You can tell that it's not smooth. Now we have a bumpy surface. It's way too inflamed. We have all kinds of crypt shapes. We have tiny ones that don't even have a lumen in this plane. We have smile. This looks like a four leaf clover. This looks like a dolphin who sees it, bottle nose, eye, fin, tail, right? So when your tissue is smiling back and you can see animals, you know you're dealing with chronic colitis. Some other fun things to look for is your crypt should be sitting right on the muscularis mucosae. So when they don't, this is called crypt shortfall. And in this case, it's because we have a layer of basal lymphoplasmocytosis. This is an example of chronic colitis in profile but you can also assess it in tangentially embedded section. On the left is normal, and on the right is abnormal. We have lots of chronic inflammation. We have glandular loss. We have all kinds of shapes and sizes of crypts. So you can assess architecture no matter how that biopsy is sent to you for the most part. Okay, I'm going to now introduce what's called a pattern-based approach to colitis. There are lots of ways and lots of schools of thought. What I'm going to present is definitely not the only way to do it. It's the way I find keeps me out of trouble. It's really simple. It helps no matter how complex your case is, no matter how simple it is, no matter how little information you have or how much. So I find this very, very helpful, and I hope you do too. So step one is to classify the colitis acute versus chronic colitis. And we just went through the definitions. Chronic colitis, if you have also an acute component, you'll want to term it active chronic colitis. If you don't, inactive chronic colitis is the better term. Step two is grade the activity. There's lots of different systems out there. This is my favorite because it's easy to incorporate into a busy service and get pretty good agreement among pathologists. It's three categories, mild, moderate, severe. Severe means you have an erosion or an ulcer. Moderate means at least half your crypts are involved with neutrophils. Mild is less than half the crypts are involved with neutrophils. So super simple. Step one and step two are you and your microscope. Step three is where everything goes off the track, and that's where you say C-note. And this is the part that takes time. You may have to look in the note. You might have to talk to the clinician. This is where you try to figure out what is the etiology, put that forward to drive etiologically specific curative therapy. This is the treacherous part. This is where you could really hurt someone or you could do a lot of good. So the bulk of this lecture, we're going to be talking about where are the red flags, where are the clues, how can I, how can I do the most good for our, my patients. All right, so let's look at, um, I hope that line's not bothering anyone. Let's look at a sample note. This person has had- Dr. Arnold, I, yes. I'm sorry. So the line is actually not bothering anyone, but oh. maybe if you go into, the, into your Zoom menu, uh, there is a little button that says more, if you can see it kind of quickly. And then uh, there is an option to disable annotations. Oh, interesting. And, if, I, and okay. it's okay. Like, I mean, it isn't really in the way, but in case it okay. was, you know. It's, um, let's see, I'm in my Zoom window. And there might be a button that says button, more. Mute my audio, rename, hide self-view. Um, I don't see other options. So. That's fine. We can just I continue. I think I'm just going to keep then. going. Everyone yep. just, I will yep. mention it and no one see it and we'll be all good. All right. So this patient has a history of IBD. This is the simplest, most straightforward case. Has IBD for 40 years, is just coming in for surveillance. Here's how we would sign it out. Step one classify the colitis, step two, grade the activity, step three, write a note. Moderate active chronic proctitis in a note. These findings would support the established history of ulcerative colitis. Every case of IBD needs an assessment for dysplasia, granulomata, and viral cytopathic effect. So super simple. This is the cleanest, straightest, shortest note that I would put out for IBD or chronic colitis. 
But that's not always the case, is it? Sometimes we have a case where we have no history. We don't know where this biopsy is coming from. There's nothing in the electronic record. And that's where I would take the same approach. Step one, classify the colitis. Step two, grade the activity. Step three, C note. So that it would be moderate active chronic colitis, same top line. And in the differential, it's where we try to put this all together. We don't have a whole lot to go on, do we? Because we don't know anything. So that's where the note would reflect that. This is etiologically nonspecific finding. The differential considerations are broad and really do include almost anything, diverticular disease, infections, medications. If you're going to list IBD, I suggest I offer always list it last because it really should be the last consideration. If IBD might be on the table again, assessing for dysplasia, granulomata, and viral cytopathic effect is important. All right, so we've gone through some notes. Um, I want to take a deep breath. Everyone can take a collective breath. This is um, my family just wanted to introduce my daughter Madeline and Jackson is my son and my husband Mike Arnold and we hiked to the top of the Rocky Mountains we're at around 10 or we're at around 10,000 feet here and there's not a lot of breath at this, you're at that high but it felt like we, my husband and I kept saying are we on a movie set it's just so gorgeous so have a breath before we dive into the first case. The first case is going to take us many different directions so it'll be the bulk of this hour Regarding sexually transmitted infectious colitis, which of the following is correct? I'm not expecting anyone to answer let, unless you'd like, but I'm just going to read the questions and move on. But think about this. A, most patients are known to be HIV positive at time of diagnosis. B, immunostains are sensitive tools. C, prominent mucosal plasma cells distinguish it from IBD. D, clinical tests are the gold standard. We're going to cover this material. The correct answer is D. Let's move on to the case. This is a 39-year-old, two-month history, progressive bloody diarrhea and severe anal pain. An endoscopy showed a circumferential 11 centimeter mass. He was told this is undoubtedly malignant and scheduled for surgery. Biopsies were performed, or this is what the endoscopic impression looked like. We see a mass, it's bulging and bleeding. Biopsies, there were three of them done over two weeks. All of them look the same. I'm sure you can appreciate this test tube-like architecture here. So the architecture is intact. The process is deeper. It's a submucosal process. It's loaded with plasma cells. This is an immunostain at the CDC that confirmed a diagnosis of lymphogranuloma venereum colitis. The little red dots are the organisms. And another stain by Dr. Lissandra Voltaggio at Hopkins highlights a spirochete. So there's two organisms going on here. This is, we're looking at syphilitic colitis. And this is an example of a process we term sexually transmitted infectious proctocolitis or STI colitis. This is caused by syphilis and or lymphogranuloma venarium. To date, it's only been seen in patients who have HIV and who are men who have sex with men. And that's very interesting to know, but I promise you, you will not always have that information. So you need to really be familiar with how it presents, which is it's going to present as a clinically worrisome ulcer or mass. They're going to think this is IBD or this is cancer. And the typical histology is prominent submucosal plasma cells, not mucosal plasma cells, it's prominent submucosal plasma cells. So here's where we're hoping our endoscopists are able to get a bite that has a little bit of submucosa. In contrast to IBD, it lacks prominent architectural changes, acute inflammation, and eosinophilia. As your quiz question was going for, clinical tests are the gold standard. We, um, we in our original series, we had 15, I believe it was 15 confirmed cases of patients with STI colitis. Only one of them had spirochetes on the immunostain. It was very, very focal. So if you have a stain in-house, it's fun, sure, use it. But if it's negative, don't give your clinicians false hope. If it's negative, I report it as non-contributory clinical tests or immunostains are far too insensitive. Please correlate with clinical studies and I'll show you what those studies are. Remember, anytime you see a mass that has lots of inflammation or an ulcer in the GI tract, consider a CMV, consider a hemo, hematolymphoid evaluation. So in this original series, what we noticed was that 
almost all the cases had been mismanaged as IBD. These patients were put on steroids, they were going for resections, and they had a curable infection. And you can see how that's kind of easy to do when there's so much morphologic overlap with IBD. So in our next study, we decided to do a head-to-head -head study of STI colitis versus IBD and try to see if we could gather any important clues. And, and here are some clues that I, that I think are very helpful, and I hope they help you too. STI colitis, you notice, has an intact architecture. We have test tube architecture. The process is deeper. It's in the submucosa, and it sometimes peaks its head up into the mucosa. In contrast, IBD has an appreciable architectural distortion at low power. High power is really important too, so make sure you take a dip on high power if you have some submucosa. And in STI, you're gonna see plasma cell rich inflammation. In IBD, it tends to be more eosinophilia, lymphocytes, histiocytes, but very, very few plasma cells. All right, so let's see how we sign this note up. This is much more complicated. This case, we're gonna follow the same rules though. It's step one, classify the colitis, step two, grade the activity, step three, write a note. So this was a mass. We said colonic mucosa with mild acute colitis, prominent submucosal plasma cells, negative for significant architectural changes, cryptocentric damage, and eosinophilia C note. Brace yourself, this is a big note, but keep in mind what we're leveraging here is HIV positive men who have sex with men behavior without ever having seen the patient. So you need to be really careful in how you approach these cases. And here's the note for this case. The history of an 11 CM mass is noted. These findings have been associated with syphilitic and or LGV infections and they can present as a mass. Clinical studies are the gold standard for confirming the diagnosis. We have to let them know to test for both organisms. I know when I first started out in training, they were just testing, uh, my surgeons were just testing for syphilis. But many of our case, patients have syphilis and LGV, just like this case. If you treat for just one infection and they have two, they're gonna continue having symptoms. They have to test for both. So it's important to evaluate for both organisms since identical histologic features can be seen with either agent in isolation or combination. I think it's worthwhile to do a CMV anytime you see a mass with lots of inflammation, it was negative. And I found over time, it's really worthwhile to include what are the tests. Keep in mind, your GI docs might not be the patient's primary care person. They might have never seen that person before. And, um, and so they might not have an existing relationship with the patient. So here are some tips that I found have been helpful in getting the results. To list the syphilis, it's a serum RPR with a titer, if that's positive, a treponemal specific serology. LGV, this is tricky. I noticed when I first started that our clinicians were doing a urine-based test and using that to screen for chlamydia. And that is not sensitive enough. I actually have to go see the patient again, swab the mucosal regularity, and send that kit for testing for chlamydia. We were sending our kits to the CDC was performing them. So I include that in there, and I follow that up with an email just to say, are there any risk factors for HIV? Kind of get that on the clinician's radar and see how they're feeling about this diagnosis. The clinicians are feeling really uneasy about this because they don't have a relationship with the patient. I mean, that's very understandable. At that point, we bring in an infectious disease consultation to help manage some of this. So I called the surgeon, and I said, what are the risk factors for HIV? And he said, he's, he's probably HIV negative. So you guys all know what that means, right? The eyeball HIV test is not effective. That means they haven't, he hasn't been tested. It's a conversation that can be challenging if you don't have a relationship with the patient. But the surgeon said, you know, he's married. I don't think he has HIV. And, and what should I ask this patient to, to help, help me get into this conversation, which is an uncomfortable question to ask a pathologist, I will admit, but I had just read something for the CDC that recommended asking with starting with how many lifetime sex partners have you had when it's just a patient in the room and the lovely wife isn't there. And so that's what they did. And he had over a thousand lifetime sex partners because he was a sex worker and he had a lovely wife. So you can have those both things at once. All right, a common question that we'll get is, should you consider this diagnosis if the patient is female? And the answer is absolutely. And that's because this is a complicated world. You don't always have the, all the information that you would like. Let a morphology be your guide. And this is our very first case of STI colitis, which we hung on to for a while because it just didn't make sense. This was from a female. We hadn't seen that, 
we weren't seeing that in the rest of the cases. But we can see it's classic STI colitis, this intact architecture, this deep submucosal process presented as a 4CM rectal mass. They thought it was colon cancer, just all the bells and whistles for STI colitis. But the female status was really not fitting our picture. So the clinician brought the patient in, and at this point she had broken out in a rash and they took a biopsy and identified the spirochetes in her skin. So this was syphilis colitis. She was tested for HIV. She was HIV positive, and the mass went away with treating the, the syphilis infection. Upon the clinician's fantastic detective work, she was born XY, but she was transgendered and identified as a female. So just a reminder, always let morphology be your guide. So we come back to our quiz question, which of the following is true? D is correct. Clinical tests are the gold standard. A is incorrect. Most of your patients with this will not know they have HIV at the time of diagnosis. Your diagnosis will ultimately lead them to the HIV testing, so it's really important to consider. B, the immunostains are not sensitive. Don't bother with them unless you have them in-house and you're prepared to write a careful note if your stain is negative. It definitely does not rule out infection. C is incorrect. Its prominent submucosal plasma cells are helpful in distinguishing it from IBD. Okay, so the, we're in case one is really a discussion about lymphoid aggregate type things and, how, and lot, when you see a lot of inflammation, how can you manage that before charging down and diagnosis of chronic colitis that might lead to IBD. So let's look at another case. This case is an anal mass. It's ulcerated. There's a big pocket of necrosis here. We see Reed Sternberg-like cells. So I had to put something in for our heme path friends, especially since Dr. Mirza is hosting us. We have also, whoops, some atypical large lymphocyte or lymphoid type cells in the background, some mitoses here. EBV is positive for those large cells. This is an EBV mucocutaneous ulcer. It is only seen or it's associated with immunosuppression and our patient had a bone marrow transplant. As scary as it looks, it's self-limited. What they do is back off the immunosuppressives, let the immune system perk up to help clear the virus. Here's the workup we kind of talked about or brushed on. I'll tell you, once I see EB, Eber positive cells, I dance my way down to heme path and have them help me because I don't want to miss a sneaky hematolymphoid lymphoma. Also, I think it's worthwhile anytime, again, you see a mass, lots of inflammation, weird atypical cells, consider getting a CMV. In this case, had EBV mucocutaneous ulceration as a diagnosis. The second line was CMV. So this is a CMV immunostain. Here's another case. This looks might look like, on first blush, like a boring case of a lymphoid aggregate in colon, but this is an example of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. And if we went on higher power, we'd see these are really atypical cells. These happen to be EBV positive. Now, the tricky mean thing here, I didn't tell you this history, but the history is so important. That's really one of the main themes of this talk. This is all about context. This was not a biopsy of a colon polyp. So we shouldn't be thinking lymphoid aggregate next case. This was a biopsy of a bone marrow transplant patient, patient with diarrhea. So look twice at those lymphoid aggregates. If there's anything funny about it, have a low threshold to show heme path and, and do some stains. Here's another uh, lovely case. I remember this case. It was just a really monster of a week. It was Friday, 8 p.m. I was exhausted, and I had this thing called polyp. And I thought, this is really big. Can I let it go or can I not let it go? And I went on higher power, and that didn't really help at all. Everything's burnt, or maybe this is primitive, but I, I decided I'm going to have to hold this case and did some immunostains. And this is a CK20 that's dot like. So this is a Merkel cell carcinoma involving the colon. That's crazy. I also sign out soft tissue, so I know this person had, a, uh, at the time, had a, a history of Merkel cell carcinoma involving the skin. And so I was having a number of red flags on this case, and staining was important. The bottom line here is take all the history you can. Use all the clues that you can. Don't be afraid to take a day to do a stain, to cut a recut, to show a friend. It can really make all the difference. Okay, so this is the continental divide. Isn't that gorgeous? And um, this is a, a put a placeholder into the talk because now we're going to switch gears. We've been looking at all of these um, really kind of emerging diagnoses, 
new entities that mimic IBD may be a little bit rare to, um, we're now gonna just dip down to earth and I want to show something to the medical students and the residents because you really have to know the next two entities that can mimic IBD and that might be in the differential of lymphoid aggregate type stuff. So let's start with this case. This is, I believe this is a sigmoid, and this does not look sigmoid. It's very villiform, some acute inflammation, lots of chronic inflammation, all the bells and whistles of an active chronic colitis. But put it in its history. So we see this piece, this picture I'm taking is from here. This is a deep dive of diverticular disease. Go a little further, go look back at the specimen. The sigmoid colon has mucosal outpouching, has a perforation at this probe. A whole mount section shows diverticular disease. This is the most common mimic of IBD. This is the diverticular associated colitis. It's due to the Western diet which is high in fat, low in fiber, forms a very hard fecal stream. It's a lot of pressure for the colon to push it through. It's most common in the sigmoid. That's the resection we're looking at. And it spares the rectum. So your surgeons are gonna be thinking this might be Crohn's disease. It's so common, we see it in over 85% of Americans over 85. So I tell folks, if this is a patient's first date with endoscopy, you're seeing chronic colitis in the left colon, you wanna be thinking diverticular disease, diverticular disease, diverticular disease. This is a curable mimic of IBD. You can cure it with treating, treat it with proper diets, antibiotics, analgesics, or surgical resection. So here's how we sign a case out. It's the same process. Step one, classify the colitis. Step two, grade the activity. Step three, write a note. The segment of colon with mild active chronic colitis and in the note, the specimen shows active chronic colitis limited to the diverticula in keeping with diverticular associated colitis. Next case, also a very bread and butter earthbound case that we all want to be aware of. This is a resection of a rectum and you can tell it's very nodular, it's villiform here, very inflamed for the rectum, all the bells and whistles of chronic colitis. Higher power, we can see there's granulomata in association with damaged crypts. And before you go down the IBD road, ask yourself, what did that resection specimen look like? So it looked like there's all these little nodules and a whole mount section of this wall shows prominent lymphoid aggregates. The next question should be, what's the history here? Why does this young person have this particular surgery? Well, it's because he was shot in the abdomen three months before. They had to emergently remove, that's a bullet. They had to emergently remove part of his colon and gave him an ostomy. He came back three months later with bloody mucoid discharge. And what we're looking at is diversion associated colitis. This is due to a surgical detour of the fecal stream. And you have to know this residents you have to know this, it's a deficiency of short chain fatty acids in the excluded bowel segment. We'll go over that in a minute. I think the surgeons and the GI docs are really great about recognizing this. So they'll often submit it as concerning for diversion, rule out diversion. If you don't have any history, you should also be thinking about it anytime you see the red flags of some kind of history of bowel resection or trauma or tumor, or if they're an older patient, diverticular disease. This is a great IBD mimic, really tough on biopsy. It's a 100% curable, unlike IBD. They can cure it by reversing the ostomy or by giving an enema with fat, uh, short chain fatty acids. So if anyone took the boards in 2010, you remember they asked us, what was the deficit in diversion colitis? Was it short chain, was it medium chain, or was it long chain fatty acids? Which I thought that was extreme, but now you all know residents, it's short chain fatty acids. And this is really important, so I put a little cartoon in. Normally, the fecal stream highlighted in green will come through this route, but this patient had been shot, so he lost this emergently, this he lost his dead bowel emergently, and this end of the bowel was then formed a stoma site on the abdominal on the anterior aspect of the abdomen, and all the fecal stream is going into the ostomy bag. And that means the rest of this valve is not getting any fecal stream, which is loaded with nutrients that the colonocytes need. So it responds by throwing off these big lymphoid aggregates. Here's how we sign the case like this out, identical process. Step one, 
classify the clay, step two, grade the activity, step three, see note. So step one, this is classified, or here we go. Segment of rectum with mild active chronic colitis and crypt rupture granulomata. In the note, the history of a colostomy, prominent mucosal nodules, and excluded bowel segment is noted. This resection specimen shows active chronic colitis limited to the excluded bowel segment in keeping with active chronic diversion associated colitis. All right, we are gonna move on to another huge topic, very important when you're thinking about IBD. This is case two, a 42 year old woman, she's a history of melanoma, presents with diarrhea, and the concern is that she's got either recurrent melanoma or she has developed ulcerative colitis. And here's a picture of the ulcers. Biopsy shows active chronic colitis. There's an erosion, acute inflammation, chronic, too much chronic inflammation for the rectum, basal lymphoplasma, cytosis, et cetera. This is an example of what I'll call immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis or ICI. This is very common. It's used for a wide variety of malignancies. In short, the therapy works by revving up the immune system to kill the tumor cells. But anytime you rev up the immune system, you could also rev up a lot of autoimmune type phenomenon. So it can affect the GI system. The histology is all over the place. It can, I, tell, I tell folks, if it, you see inflammation and there's a history of tumor, think about ICI colitis. It can mimic important processes like graft versus host disease, autoimmune neuropathy, CMV, and inflammatory bowel disease. It's treat, if the clinicians know about it, they can treat it by stopping the drug or adding immunosuppression. When ICI first came out, you know, buzzwords to look for was metastatic melanoma or relapsed CLL or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. But now it's being used in a wide variety of tumors. So you really wanna have a low threshold to recognize it. These are some of the words, very big words, very long terms here. Just if you're familiar with it, it'll be helpful when you look through the electronic record. Lots of terrific papers have been coming out on this entity. I wanted to highlight this one from Dr. Patel, who's one of our Twitter followers, and Dr. Zhang, a really nice review. It is a it's e-published ahead of print in archives right now, going through the pathologic manifestations of GI and hepatobiliary injury. So definitely check it out. For our medical students and trainees, these terms are really challenging. And so here's a little tip that I am attributing to Dr. John Barone about how you can take these complicated terms and glean something from them. The NEVO, well, that is nonsense. That is a prefix the pharmacy comes up with. It sounds new and effective and strong and beautiful. Um, so that you don't want to pay too much attention to. But the L means something. That means it's the antibody target. Tells you the antibody target is immune modulating. The U means something, you can decode that. It's the antibody source from the human. And MAB means monoclonal antibody. So no matter what new generation drug comes out, if you can recognize this, you can decode that term. It can help you run to the chart really quickly and help you pronounce it when you have to at tumor board. This is also for our medical students and junior trainees. This is probably too um, simplistic for our faculty out there, but I want to have something for everyone. The PD-1, PD-L1 access has revolutionized pathology, and this is something that we're referencing, this immune checkpoint inhibitor. Here's a, a little bit of the molecular bite that's important to be aware of. It's very exciting. It's done a lot of, of wonderful things for our oncology patients. So in essence, Tumors that bind PD-1 can hide from the immune system. That's what we're going to show here. This is a T cell. It has a PD-1 receptor. If a tumor cell can engage that PD-1 receptor through its PD-1 ligand, engages both of these sites, it can put the T cell to sleep. It's grayed off, and the tumor cell can thrive. It can hide from the immune system, and it can wreak havoc. So you can imagine if you can disrupt this binding, you can disrupt this pathway and find a new way to kill the tumor cells. And that's exactly how these drugs work. They block this interaction here, wake up the immune system to kill the tumor cell. So pretty interesting, very, very important to know about this pathway. Now putting this all together, here's our case of ipilimumab colitis. We do the same process, grade, classify the colitis, step two, grade the activity, step three, write a note. So this is an example of severe active chronic proctitis with erosion. 
In the note, we'll say the history of metastatic melanoma and ipilimumab therapy is noted. Active chronic proctitis is a known side effect of this drug, and in these cases, the symptomatology and histology can normalize by stopping the drug or adding immunosuppression. I want to take this just one step further and leave you with a bite. This is probably has more questions than answers, but this is a very nice study that Dr. Castle just came out with a few days ago as the lead author in, and, and histopathology. And it's an it's really interesting. So what we had noticed is a lot of patients have GI side effects when they're on these drugs. And we had wondered if we stained select cases with PD-1 and PDL one would we identify a unique signature that would help distinguish ICI colitis from its mimics? That's IBD, infectious colitis, et cetera. So it's all here, but I've simplified it a little bit into the scheme that might be a little easier to see at this power. Let's see, so um, what we're gonna look at is colitis, there's inflammation, it turns blue. Yellow is gonna signify our PD-1 lymphocytes. PDL1 is going to be signified by these purple like, flags. So we took normal, which were the edges of margins for ischemic bowel cases or patients who were on ICI therapy who didn't have diarrhea. And we did these stains and assessments. We found they weren't inflamed. They had no PD1 lymphocytes. They had no PDL1 expression. Then we looked at our patients who had clinically confirmed ICI colitis, very inflamed, no PD-1 lymphocytes, and that's probably because they're on an anti-PD-1 drug that obscures their reacting with their immunostain, and they had some moderate PD-L1 expression on the clonic epithelium. And we compared that with the mimics, which is IBD, very inflamed, lots of PD-1 lymphocytes, and lots and lots, the most amount of PD-L1 expression on the clonic epithelium. And we also compared it with infectious colitis, which was very inflamed, had the most PD-1 lymphocytes, and had some pd one expression on the epithelium. So really interesting work. Definitely check it out. Um, we, were, we had envisioned this project as a way to help um, identify maybe a signature motif to help confirm ICI colitis from its mimics. And statistically, this is significant. On a practical side, as a pathologist who signs out every day, there is no way I'm ordering these stains to get to this diagnosis because I will not diverge from my pattern-based approach to colitis. This is statistically significant, but it's not good enough. This is just too important of a diagnosis. So it really, the, the the great aspects about this paper is it's going to help build the story, start a discussion of this access in non-neoplastic epithelium, but there's lots more to report. I want to, before we go on to our next case, just take a minute to thank the Virtual Pathology Grand Rounds crew. This is the executive committee. They're doing marvelous things. They are really anchoring our new normal and providing this context to connect and share science and advance patient care. And I just cannot thank them enough. Make sure you send them a DM and thank them for all the work they're doing. Okay, moving on. The correct statement about this resin, here's a quiz question. It's always benign. It's used for high cholesterol never has fish scales, or it's always orange. So give that some thought. And we'll move on to case three. This is a 67-year-old who underwent emergent total colectomy for medically refractory CMV, and they were worried she had IBD as well. Resection shows this bloody milieu and punched out ulcers and some white little fragments here and here. Whole mount section, or the wall shows severe active chronic colitis with ulcer, all your buzzwords, higher power, we have CMV, and for our trainees, it's a nuclear inclusion, looks like an owl's eye and cytoplasmic inclusions. But don't forget to look for your second diagnoses because in the lumen is your quiz question, it's these orange resins. If you don't know what those resins are, you're in good company. So we did a, we did a little stir, survey in 2016 of our Roger Haggett Society members on Twitter, and the diagnostic accuracy was 76%, lots of room for improvement. Um, I'm going to show you a really wonderful article that uh, Raul Gonzalez put together. He is just an expert in this field, and he's written some really wonderful work. And this is challenging. This is challenges in diagnosing medication resins: a crystal clear review guide and archives. There are three types of resins, and for our trainees, these resins are usually swallowed. They bind an ion of interest irreversibly, and because they are not absorbed, they go through the GI tract and are excreted. And that's how they deplete the body of the ion of interest. 
There's three that you want to know about. The bile acid sequestrants are from your quiz question. They target bind bile acids. And we know from our study that they are almost always used for diarrhea. So for when you see them, look for causes of diarrhea. We have over 90 year collective experience with them. They do not cause mucosal injury. You probably have all have heard of KX Light or sodium polystyrene sulfonate. It's purple with these internal fish scales. It's used in renal failure patients to deplete potassium. Either it or its diluent can sometimes cause ischemia ulceration perforation. And we just described Cevelimir not too long ago. It's most often confused for KX late, and that's because it's seen in similar demographics of renal failure patients. It lowers phosphate. And it's usually two-toned, and it usually has fish scales. Does it cause injury? In our study, it was very small, but we showed a dose-dependent response with injury. Several other papers have also said the same thing. I don't think it always causes injury, but I think if the person has an underlying dysmotility, it sets them up for some ischemia ulceration perforations. All right, so here's some secrets. Um, BAS or the resins are not always crystal shaped. Sometimes they can be round. More, this is more work from Dr. Gonzalez when he was at Vanderbilt. Be aware there are many, many BAS. If you call all these orange resins cholestyramine, you are going to be wrong a lot of the time. Just simplify it and call it BAS, or you'll have to look in the chart to confirm which one. I think the most important re reason, reason to recognize these is because there are clues to important diagnoses. So when you see this resin, you know the patient has diarrhea, look very carefully for other causes of diarrhea. This is another example where this diagnosis might be hard because the H&E is not so great, but we see a fish scales on this orange crystal. We know that this is the patient's on Cevelomir. So when we see Cevelomir or KX light, we know the patient has renal failure. Think about your other causes of, uh, or other diagnoses with renal failure, such as amyloid. And then the resin is pointing to amyloid, even on this terrible H&E. It's pink, it's extracellular, it's got this kind of water crack artifacts. The amyloid is orange on a Congo red. Secret number four, fish scales are overrated. They can really confuse you if you put too much weight in it. Just look at these fish scales. And I'm gonna tell you, neither one of these are resins. I think sometimes these fish scales are a knife artifact and anything can have fish scales if it's thick enough or the blade is dull enough. All right, so that often brings a common question is, well, what stain can I do? I think your best stain is H&E followed by looking in the chart and what medication they're in. That's what I do 100, almost 100% 100 of the time. But sometimes you have nothing in the chart and that's not helpful and all you have is a block. In that case, AFB can be really nice. It'll make the PAS yellow, KX late black, and Cevelomir magenta. All right, this slide is mnemonics for our trainees. KX light, remember your Ks. And I put this mnemonic together because they all can kind of blend in your mind. We want to set, separate them out in discrete categories. So remember, cracks can kill. When you see those fish scales, just be careful. It's known to cause ulcers and ischemia. Lowers K, or potassium. BAS, remember all your Bs. Benign, burnt orange. They lower bile acids. There are bunches and bunches of them. Savalimir, I have no mnemonic, so I need my friends in Twitter. I need you guys to give me a mnemonic that starts with an S. I put this up here and usually someone who's on KX Litter Savelomir will write me and be concerned. And I just have to remind you, this is a mnemonic. It's for medical device. It's for memorization. It's definitely KX Litter and Savelomir are not harmful in the majority of cases or they would never be on the market. It's really a minority of patients who, who um, have issues with it. So when we see KX Litter and Savelomir and you have background injury, you do want to call your surgeon or clinician and let them know, but the majority of cases you won't have any injury with them. So getting back to our case, how we sign this out, same process, step one, classify, step two, grade the activity, step three, see no. So colorectum with severe active chronic colitis, ulcers, CMV, and benign BAS crystals. In the note, the specimen shows active chronic colitis with CMV and BAS. The active chronic changes are favored due to the known history of chronic CMV. Bile acid sequesterants have no role in causing mucosal injury. If they're still worried about IBD, of course, they can repeat endoscopy after the CMV has been eradicated and they can include upper endoscopy. 
So if we come back to our quiz question, the correct statement about this resin, the answer is, it's a hard question, but it's always benign. BAS are used to be used for high cholesterol, are, they used to be used for cholesterol, not anymore. Them, now they've been replaced with statins. They sometimes see, sometimes it will have fish scales if it's a thick section. D, they're not always orange, their color can change a little bit. Of all the medications you're gonna see in the GI tract, this is the most common. And if you saw Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay's amazing talk on CAP virtual path, you know what this is. Or if you sign out pulmonary path, this is gonna be really easy for you. But we tried, we traced this down for quite some time. I'm too embarrassed to say how long. It took us a while to realize that this is cross povidone. So we have architect, this looks like a coral architecture as a pink center, as a purple coat. It's almost always seen with this colorless material. It's a matchstick shape here. It's a square with a circle here. And if you flip your condenser and have polarized light, it's brightly refractile. This is microcrystalline cellulose or MCC. It's a really fun project. Um, we did the first series, Dr. Sophia Shady, who's an amazing resident did this and found that we had saw it in 10% of all of our specimens. So pretty. When your clinicians come by or trainees come by, it's really fun to point that out. Do I ever put it in a report? Almost never, heck no. It doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's biologically inert. So the pharmaceutical companies add it to all kinds of consumables to make things white and smooth and dissolve. It's in the GI tract where it's supposed to be. So that's not pathological, unlike when you see it in the pool lungs like Dr. Mokopati went over. I also, while we're talking about all these colorful things, pay attention to this. Looks almost like an air bubble or an artifact. But this is the new look of yttrium Y90. You're probably familiar with Y90, the serosphere version over here on this right side. You can't miss it. It's, it's bright purple and brilliant. But this is also a radiation bead. And this case is from Dr. Marion Peugeot at Northwestern who has amazing eyes and she's only been in practice a few years and she's already had really wonderful papers. She's just a terrific pathologist. So um, what do I wanna say about these? Well, beads, okay. Be these beads are given to patients who have a liver tumor and they're delivered right to the liver tumor so the radiation can be sky high because they're gonna go right to that tumor. Unfortunately, sometimes these beads reflux into neighboring tissue. So you might see them in the gallbladder, the stomach, the pancreas. And when they go to these other sites, they can cause radiation injury. It's important to be aware of them because when you see these beads, you know this patient has a tumor, you need to be careful. They can also explain the background gastritis or radiation injury that we're seeing in the background. This is a nice paper that uh, Dr. Voltaggio is a senior author in AGSP not too long ago. Other, other tidbits to know, when you see serospheres, this is FDA approved to treat colorectal cancer and that's metastasized to the liver. And therospheres, the cleared version, is used is FDA approved for hepatocellular carcinoma. Now I say that and I'll tell you, we had some institutions that only use therosphere and that's becoming much more popular. And that's because it's thought to have less reflux into other tissues. That, that may or may not be the case. I'm not quite sure about that yet. But it's important to be aware of they're really easy to miss and they offer a lot of clues. If you're looking at this and you're thinking, um, I don't believe this. I don't think that's anything. I had, I'm with you. I had a hard time believing it. So Dr. Voltaggio reached out to the pharmaceutical company, got the beads, and we processed them. They look just like what they look like in the tissue. If you put your condenser in, it has this bullseye, this little center circle, just like how they do in the tissue. Polarized light, it forms this kind of cross in the middle. So this is definitely a geometric structure. This is not an artifact. All right, this is us yesterday. We went hiking to the very top of Shadow Canyon. It was amazing. Uh, that brings us to case four. This is a short little case. Um, 88 year old who has an abdominal aortic aneurysm, had a dead bowel. I saved this case. I had so many stacks of cases this day. I kept saving it for the end. This is my last case and I was just horrified that I thought it was gonna be a boring case. Definitely has a steamy in the background. We see that here with lamin appropriate hyalinization. But there's something else right there, the arrow. <laughs> here it is again, higher power, basophilic stippling, kind of this linear, Serpiginous pattern. 
It's bright blue and colloidal iron. This is hydrophilic polymers. And we wrote this up with Dr. Chavez as the lead author, who was a fantastic pathology resident, called it hydrophilic polymer associated ischemic enterocolitis. And we see this in up to 20% of patients who have a AAA repair. So if you get a dead bowel from a AAA patient, that's not a boring specimen. Up to 20% of them will have these polymers. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the polymers, how they work, let's imagine a patient has a, a AAA, they have an a, a abdominal aortic aneurysm. They're going to replace a graft. The graft, if they just shove it into the aorta, it's going to cause all kinds of vascular damage and thromboses and vasospasms. So what happens when people put instruments into vessels is they coat them first with polymers that are slippery little substances that allow instruments to go into vessels with minimizing trauma. The problem is they're so slippery they can slip right off and cause thromboembolisms downstream. So look out for them. I just want to mention that the morphology of these will change over time. So this is a patient who had a AAA. As soon as they put the graft in, the bowel died, and they deliver to us the bowel, which is seen here with these very vibrant polymers. And there's loads of clots all over the graft, and that we process the, that as well. And it also is loaded with polymers. This patient survived, thank goodness, came back a few months later to have the ostomy reversed. And what we can see is that the polymers look less vibrant. They're getting chewed up by giant cells. So this is important. Why I bring it up in this discussion is because ischemia can also cause chronic colitis. If you have these polymers, don't confuse them for parasites. There's no eosinophilia. They do not have internal structures. And um, that annotation is really interesting. It's mesmerizing me. And the, uh, the, 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 the giant cell morphology. reaction is not a granuloma. Don't have your patients thinking about Crohn's disease. These are just eating up. This is a formed by a giant cell reaction. Okay, so this is my son. He has just hiked all day to the top of this point, and he loves to put his hands out and fly when he gets up there. Not really fly, but feeling very accomplished. And I hope you guys all feel like you have accomplished a lot in this hour, and you have lots of new tools in your toolkit to work through these challenging cases. Here's our take-home messages and all this fun annotations. Remember, if you remember just one thing, please remember chronic colitis is specific for nothing. IBD is always a diagnosis of exclusion. Always consider curable causes of chronic colitis first. And that is, we walk through all of these infections, medications, diverticular disease, diversion, and ischemia. I hope the pattern-based approach to colitis is helpful. Step one, classify the colitis. Step two, grade the activity. Step three, write a note. Thank you all for inviting me. I hope that was helpful. Please let me know. I'm going to leave you with my favorite picture of Colorado for obvious reasons. I hope you all enjoy it too. Thank you. Wonderful. You know, one of the things we miss about the real Grand Rounds is the sound of applause. So I really want to thank Dr. Christina Arnold for an amazing hour. This was just amazing. I mean, I'm not a GI pathologist and I loved every minute of it. And I encourage everyone to use the reactions tab in your Zoom button to show your appreciation. You can give her a thumbs up or a little applause button. And, you know, at least we can try and recreate that. Thank you so much, Dr. Arnold, uh, for your time and for this excellent lecture. Uh, as a reminder for everybody, uh, there is a link that I have posted in the chat feature. Uh, when you paste that link into your browser, if you complete that evaluation form, please put in your email address at the top. That email address will be what uh, the ASCP uh, and we will use to send you information about the CME. Also, the question and answer session now is open. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have some uh, really uh, burning questions, please put them in the chat box. All right, Dr. Arnold, right now it's all just people saying how amazing this lecture was. There oh, is fantastic. sounds of thunderous Good. applause and lots and lots of <laughs> gratitude. And obviously people were taking notes. So these annotations, I believe, are just people taking notes on their screens, which, you know, somehow we are able to see. That's and it's, awesome. It's I love it. Way, it's just a proof that people were really paying attention. Well, I think I love they're pointing to this cloud and this cloud. I love those exactly. clouds too. So. Exactly. <laughs> There are some questions about when the recording will be available. Around a week from now on virtualpath.org, the recordings for all virtual pathology grand rounds are there, uh, and you can, um, you can access them. There we go. People are putting more uh, things up. That is, that is nice.
Thank you. I love the response. I'm glad there's no thumbs down option. No, no thumbs down <laughs> options because they were they were not required. You had like over 220 people listening in today, Dr. Oh, Arnold. Really great. All right. So I know that um, uh, Dr. Arnold is on social media. She's very active on pathology, pathology social media. Um, there is one question that just came in, and that is, how do you differentiate diverticular disease-associated colitis versus ulcerative colitis? Right. That's a common question that really makes a difference for the patients. So if you say, some, let's say someone has a, been in a car accident and they, and they have diarrhea, and the question is, is it ulcerative colitis? And if it is, they're taking the whole colon, or is it diversion colitis, and they're taking a little snippet? Those are, those are the really difficult questions. And on biopsy, <clears throat> it can be very challenging. So um, what I tend to do is, first of all, always, in a, case, in a case where you're wondering what's the cause of colitis, look at the notes. So if they have a history of a recent diverge, uh, rerouting more trauma or a, in any case where they might have had a, a surgical detour of the fecal stream, diversion colitis has to be on the list. Separate it out from UC is challenging. If you see lots of lymphoid aggregates, that's something that will favor a diagnosis of diversion colitis. The timing of the procedure or enemas and, and symptoms, that can be also very helpful. I would say probably all the cases I've had where there was a question of diversion versus ulcerative colitis, I've always, I have never top lined it either way. I've said I favor this, I favor diverticular colitis, and I'll list the reasons why, but I don't unilaterally come out and say um, diversion versus UC because there is a lot of overlap. What else do I want to say about that? I hope that's helpful. Those are good. That's a good no, case. I think that's really, really great. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question. Okay. Uh, this last question is, do we see ischemic changes in KXLA? Oh, so that's a great question. So KXLA and Cevelomir, I kind of think of them a little bit together in that they both have internal, those little fish scales, and they both can cause injury in a subset of patients. The majority of your patients who you'll see with these resins are going to be stone cold normal, or they're not going to have anything, any kind of damage related to that resin. And um, for whatever reason, a subset of patients will have injury in association with these resins. And in those injurious patterns, commonly it is going to be ischemia, ulcerations, perforations, dead bowels. And sorry, did I can't answer that question? Yes, I think so. Okay. That's really, really great. All right. With that, again, we thank you, Dr. Arnold. Uh, our virtual pathology thank grand round comes to a close. Please follow us on Twitter. And so you'll be able to see our schedule and all the recordings are posted at virtualpath.org. We'll see you next time. Thank you.